good to be here this morning. I invite you to open up your New Testament to the Gospel of Mark. Mark, the first chapter. Uh, as we mentioned before, last Sunday morning we had kind of an intro just into the uh, character of the author, Mark. We look at a few things. It's kind of interesting about him. I, I, I find encouraging is that uh, Mark is kind of the restored uh, individual who kind of uh, let some people down. He let Barn or Paul down uh, because he didn't finish the whole trip when they were preaching the gospel. He went back home, and when they were trying to decide on who was going to be uh, needful in the second trip, they didn't want anything to do with Mark. At least Paul did. And Paul didn't trust him, but Barnabas kind of the encourager kind of said, oh, "He can come along with me." And, and Mark uh, comes back and he shows really the picture what the gospel is all about. The gospel is all about helping people like Mark. It's a, it's a message of redemption, a message that Christ came, number one, to show us how inadequate we are, so that we'll realize how much we need to turn to God, but also to demonstrate and illustrate the vast mercy and the kindness and the love of God that uh, throughout the Old Testament, especially individuals uh, who were, were adamant to... to bind to certain things about God's law on people, went above and beyond what the law said, and we're emphasizing so many of those things, and Jesus called them on it and said, but you're forgetting about the kindness and the mercy and the patience and, and the wonderful attributes of God. And so this is really the beginning of Mark telling this story about uh, the message of Jesus, that message of redemption, patience, love, and introducing people to God in a way that they... We had forgotten how, how God could be seen. Let's just go uh, read through it and uh, and uh, we'll kind of hit the points uh, as we come along and, and make some applications for us. Uh, let's first read the first uh, eight verses here together. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, <laughs> Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him. And all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. So Mark begins with this, this great phrase, kind of the introduction, kind of the preview to the coming attraction. His preview verse is, this is the beginning of the gospel. And Mark does not go into a lot of detail of the birth of Jesus. He doesn't go into a lot of detail of who he's connected to in the genealogy. Because he wants to realize that's not the beginning of Jesus. That's not the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel is way back hundreds of years earlier when there was a statement by Isaiah. It's a way Mark is kind of showing how God loves to say uh, to a certain degree about his promises, I told you so. You may, maybe you didn't think it was going to happen. I told you this was going to happen. This is how Mark says that the beginning of the gospel is confirmation of God saying, I know it's been a long time since you've heard anything from God. It's been, literally been 400 years. It's been about 400 years since anybody heard anything about uh, the coming kingdom. What's God doing about this? In fact, the last thing that anybody heard from God was about this coming in the way of Elijah. That someone's going to come before the Messiah. And in a way, I love it, what Mark is doing is saying, God never forgets. We, we, we sometimes, maybe the longer time goes on, we can maybe forget about things. Not 
not God. And I love this. This is basically breaking the silence of 400 years and saying, I want to show you something. All these things that happened is basically fulfilling what God already said was going to happen. And basically confirming all the things that happened. In other words, Mark's audience needs to right away have confirmation of the things that happened. That this is legitimately, this is what God did. And that God is putting a stamp of approval that this is not just some, some kind of a, 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 a fringe movement. This is not somebody who just has some kind of a personal um, axe to grind. They don't have some personal motives behind this. This is all God's doing. And as we talked about in the first, uh, first overview of the Gospel of Mark, the, the earliest document that they found, it was something like 60 to 80 AD. That was just a copy. So we're talking about the time the, the actual Gospel was written. We're talking probably about 30 years after the events of Jesus. You know, it's interesting now, you know, you ever hear something that just seems too good to be true? Just, I don't know. You ever see those, those things, you get emails, or maybe you see it posted on Facebook, uh, you know, somebody had a cat, and, and that cat wrote a message uh, out in the dirt that something was going to happen, and, and then this individual got this message and, and found out, well, this, this message that the cat wrote is related to something that this other neighbor's cat did, and oh, isn't that amazing? And you go on Snopes, and no, sorry, uh, debunk that. That's not true. It didn't happen. People are always trying to debunk things. They just seem too good to be true, right? Well, basically what Mark is saying, nobody in Jesus' day could debunk what was happening. This is the real deal. And Mark is saying, I'm telling you, this is before we get into the message, you've got to know how exciting this is. Nobody could disprove this because this is God's stamp of approval saying, He talked about this. If anybody does it, wait, wait, let me show you this passage. Written hundreds of years before any of this happened, God said this is how it's going to happen. It happened this way. And so John comes out uh, basically pointing people to Jesus. Uh, make ready the way of the Lord. And the image is that he's trying to make their paths straight. In other words, to, to make it clear the pathway to Jesus. Because John's preaching is very unique, especially it was, it was unique for the, the Jewish people because what Jesus is going to do is Jesus is going to teach people, guess what? You don't need any of these rituals. You don't need any of these uh, traditions that have spurred out, out of the law of Moses. All of those things were temporary to show you who could really help you, who could really save you. That you can be as loyal and faithful to the traditions, as loyal and faithful to, to showing up at the temple and going through all the things faithfully that you need to do and those things were necessary for a certain time. But John the Baptist shows up basically saying, guess what? The time for all that stuff is over. We don't need that anymore. So when he says repent, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he's teaching people that they need to truly look to God. And Jesus is going to be the one that shows us how connected we can be to God how truly close we can get to God without formalism. We don't need that. That's unnecessary. It's hurtful. It's harmful. That's not saying that there aren't things that we need to abide by uh, things in terms of how we worship. That's not saying that we don't need to uh, follow those instructions. Yes, we do. But we also have to be very, very careful that we don't build our trust and our confidence in God on those things. And Mark lets us realize that that was one of the first messages that came out, what John the Baptist did was saying, guess what, stop putting your faith and your hope in the religious practices of the Jewish faith and just look to God. Just look to Him and I'm going to show you how you do that. And so it was very, very unique in that regard. In fact, another passage that emphasizes this, Luke 16, verse 16, we're going to look that up at some point, basically says uh, uh, the law and the prophets were until John. This is what it says, until that time, or that time after, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached. And Jesus is going to show in many ways how we do that, how we totally need to separate ourselves from religious traditions. We need to separate ourselves from a confidence in, in, in religious formalism and have our total faith in do I Acknowledge who God is? Am I willing to totally change and embrace who God is? And my willingness to do so and my faithfulness to that will save me from the sins that have separated me from Him 
And I can truly worship God being free from the truth of what God expects me to do. And there's going to be naturally a, a unified body of believers that results from this. And there are going to be certain things that we have to abide by the first day of the week. There's a, a certain way in which we remember the Lord. Yes, we need to keep that in mind. But I think that this message, repent and believe in the gospel, is just as relevant today as it was then. Especially for people who put a lot of their faith in their religion. And that's the question I want to ask. Where is your faith? If your faith is in a religion, it's off point. If your faith is in religious ritualism, it's off point. John the Baptist came with that message, repent and believe in the gospel that is to come here. And I'm going to show you what that's like. So all kinds of people are coming out to be baptized. And John is doing that, basically leading them the way. What John is really doing is he, he's introducing people. He's kind of preparing people for who he wants to introduce them to. It's kind of like, you know, if you ever see a couple people and they're dating and they're, they're moving past just, uh, what's your favorite movie? Uh, what's your favorite thing to eat? What's your favorite dessert? And they're getting to seriously think about maybe what their compatibility is like and it's time to meet the parents. And, and there have been one of those videos where before the, you go ahead and get to the door, okay, before you come in, you meet my dad. I got, I got some things I got to tell you about. <laughs> Before you walk in this door, I, I want to tell you what, you, what you're about to experience, okay? We prepare people, right? Because some things are a little shocking, maybe. We, just, we, just, we're not, we can't embrace everything right off the bat. That's what John is doing. He's saying, Before I, we let Jesus come right and meet you people, let me prepare you for what you're about to see. And John, really, in his lifestyle, was showing them because he was separating himself completely from all the things so many of the Jewish people clung to. All the material possessions. All the success that they felt they gained from their religious pursuits. And John was saying that means absolutely nothing. In fact, you've been blinded by it. And Jesus is going to confirm that message. And he's going to preach a message of total dependence on God and that that's really what's going to free you from these things. And we need that message more than ever. And a message that needs to be preached that way. Something else I find amazing about John the Baptist is how he preached. He preached with such humility, basically saying, I, I know it seems like I'm someone great, because I'm out here, I've got this wild way of, of lifestyle, I've got some wild... Some wild clothes on. I don't live the way a lot of people do. I know that's a little excitable. But he basically said all this, I'm doing all this because I want one thing. I want everybody to listen, to look at, and to cling to every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth. He says, my himself, I'm nothing. John the Baptist was a great preacher and that he preached with humility. He said, don't look at me. In fact, anything that, that brings you to my to, to my area here in the wilderness is all for the sole purpose that I can show you someone so much better than I am. It's interesting, you know, John was filled with the Spirit. You ever hear people maybe say, they talk about, oh, you got to hear such and such because they're filled with the Spirit. You hear someone say, oh, you've you got to come to, and hear those individuals. They're so filled with the Spirit. John literally was filled with the Spirit. And you know what marked that? He wanted nothing more than everybody to be in awe of Jesus, not his preaching, not his antics, not what he did. He wanted everybody to be in love and in awe of the message of the gospel. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And John was. And he had one purpose. I want you to clear your mind of anything else you think associates you with God. And I want you to just listen to what Jesus says. And we need to do that ourselves. Maybe there are those among us here this morning who still need perhaps despite the fact that you are doing everything right religiously, maybe perhaps still need to repent and believe in the gospel. And that's what Mark is saying. He said that was the message of John and pointed us to Jesus. So Jesus shows up and he's baptized by John. In verse 9 it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John 
in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. There are two things I think we can learn from this event. One is the reason why John wanted all the attention. John wanted all the focus on Jesus, not on himself. Because there's one thing Jesus could claim that John could never claim. And it's being absolutely 100% perfect when it came to how God looked at him. There is only one individual who could ever 100% claim, I am well pleased in the eyes of my Father. You know what I love about Jesus? Unlike so many people, the religious people who led them in this period of time, he used his perfection to serve. And him allowing John to ba essentially baptize him is showing his humility, how he's going to be a, a perfect servant. He's one who comes to basically serve the purposes of God. Because essentially that's what it says. It says it came to fulfill all righteousness. This is part of God's plan. This is part of uh, being full of the Spirit. And the uh, heavens open basically to claim that this one, this one is the only one who can claim absolute perfection. Therefore, listen to Him. And what is so amazing about the message of Jesus, He did not come down on individuals. At least those uh, who, who humbly needed to be built up. Yes, He came down rather harshly on the individuals who didn't listen to John's preaching. And there's several indications that there were all kinds of religious individuals. Remember it says that the Pharisees came out to be baptized by John and they got a tongue lashing from them. What do you, what do you think you're doing out here? You think, you think that just your religious formalism, that's what you're coming here to do. You're just sending a claim. I've checked off the list. I did one more thing that God told me to do and I'm good to go. And I can continue to look down at everybody else who has all these problems in their life. And Jesus came to rebuke that and to exalt individuals who by their own lack of righteous ability, by their own weaknesses, the things that had destroyed their lives were in the perfect position to hear a message, you need God. And Jesus was the perfect one to tell them that. Nobody else could ever dare be put in a position. And so I think Mark is also demonstrating it. Mark is, is an evangelist. Mark was one who went about supporting people who preached the gospel. We've also, right off the bat, is demonstrating what manner preaching needs to be done in. And the manner of taking whatever knowledge, whatever uh, abilities we have, and using it to serve those who need to see that by the direction that life has taken them through their sins, they're in a great position to feel redemption if they will accept the message of God to repent and believe in the gospel. And so Jesus is baptized, demonstrating that He hears the words from God saying, You are my beloved Son. Immediately in verse 12, it says, Immediately the Spirit impelled Him to go out into the wilderness. And He was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan... And it was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. In one way also, to prove, to verify. It's one thing for someone to say, this is who you are. Another thing to prove it, to demonstrate that. And Jesus is going to be all about that, about how we behave, how we live. What's the manner of our lifestyle? What's the manner of our trust? What practically do those things look like? Those things matter more so than words. Yes, you, can, you cannot argue when God says something. When God says, this is my son and I, 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 you are my beloved and you I'm well pleased. Now Jesus demonstrates it. And He demonstrates it in a very unique way. The Spirit leads Him. In other words, He's obedient. He's trusting. He allows the direction of the Spirit in His life to put him in a situation that jeopardizes his comfort, jeopardizes uh, his safety. Uh, I guess the, you don't have to go too far in this country. Maybe the backwoods is some some scary places. Maybe you get some sense of being out in the wilderness and <laughs> what it's like when you don't have the safety of having uh, Wi-Fi service <laughs> or, or internet connection, and <laughs> sometimes that's alone to make us feel terrified. <laughs> I, I, my, my cell phone's dead here. I can't. I can't connect to anybody. But just imagine that. Just put in your mind there. Jesus went somewhere with no Wi-Fi service, 
no connection, and constantly being under threat of wild beasts. And what we find is Jesus was totally fine there. All of Satan's temptations to come at him did not succeed. I believe Jesus is showing what it looks like when we repent. And when we believe in the gospel, he's trusting that his dependency on God is all that anybody needs. That's it. Jesus is going to show over and over and over again, the only thing that we need is the gospel. And what the gospel liberates us from. Now, a part of that, yes, we're going to talk about eventually just how we, how we worship and how we uh, praise God, how we live God. All those things are components of that. But initially, we need to realize that when we get led, or when we are in situations of life, when it seems like we are in the wilderness, when all our comforts are taken away from us, and we are right in the middle of a major danger uh, of things that can threaten and, and destroy us, that there's ability, there's a peacefulness. And remember, Jesus is going to show this in a remarkable way when His disciples are in the middle of a huge storm, and the water it keeps continually coming into their boats, threatening that they're going to sink. And Jesus is what? He's asleep. And they rouse him. They wake up and say, what's the matter? Don't you care that we're in danger? Mark is setting us up for why someone like that could do what he did. Why can someone be uh, almost asleep when threats of danger are going on? Because he showed what it means to live by the Spirit. What it means to live according to the message of the Gospel is man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that frees us. That liberates us. For the, like, we need all these things. Isn't that amazing that we can live through this life with all its uncertainties and all the things that, that, that elude us to make us feel that we're comforted, that even if they leave us, that we have everything we need. And Jesus came to demonstrate that and show He wants to give people this peace. And so He has showed that He can overcome the threats of Satan and He is the one that can redeem us from the things that Satan brings into our lives. Next thing we see him do is actually go out and start recruiting people, start recruiting people to help him on this mission. He's going to need some people to help him preach and teach in verse 14. It says, And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And verse 16 says, As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, going on a little farther. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and went away to follow him. You know, it seems that there are certain things in life that's never probably not the best thing to just say, well, just jump right in. There are certain things I think that we need a little bit of caution, maybe a little bit of training would, would help us. Then just say, oh, okay, I, I think I got the gist of it. Let me just go ahead and learn as I go along. A lot of things, maybe that would be the best idea. But I'm actually looking forward to uh, to uh, the, Nathan's organizing a, a, a trip here this weekend. Uh, we're going to white water rafting. Just uh, uh, reminded me about that. Uh, I've only been maybe a, a couple of times, but I never forget one time. I never forget. I've never been on the gully. My father used to go on uh, the gully river all the time. And I was frightened enough by the videos he'd bring home and show me. Just there'd be people that would disappear in that water, and they'd be counting. Like by the time they got to eleven. Okay, this guy, <laughs> this guy pops up down the river a little bit. And, like, Ooh. and I don't forget, I remember there were some friends of mine that they were all going to arrange a, a whitewater rafting trip. And they wanted me to go along with them. They, I said, where are you going? They said, we're going to the gully. I said, I'm not going. No, you guys, you guys, oh, they said, it would be great. We're going to the gully river. I said, I have seen, I said, have you ever been whitewater rafting before? I said, no, none of them had. I said, no, I'm not going. They went, and I remember my roommate, when he got back from that trip, he comes and he looks white as a ghost. I never forget, he didn't say a word to me, didn't even look at me, walked up to his room. He didn't come out of his room for three days. 
I've never to this day talked to him about the trip. Other people told me and said, we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he just going to jump right in. Certain things, like, you know, we, we, we excited. Something maybe not the best idea to jump right in. When it comes to spreading the message, repent. Believe in the gospel. You know what Jesus' attitude was? Jump on in, buddy. You want to come with me? I don't have any training. I don't care. Jump on in. What if I mess up? The gospel is for messed up people. The, the, that's the beauty of jumping right in. What if I mess it up? Well, your message is to show people that are messed up what God thinks of that and how He can provide an answer to get you not so messed up. And it's not by just going ahead and fixing all the things. I get my life right first. No, it's true repentance. How much do you trust God? How much are you willing to give your whole self into letting Him be in control? And how much are you willing to confess that you need a lot of guidance and help to develop that? That's, that's the gospel. It's the beginning of, what, that's what Mark said, this is the beginning. The beginning of the gospel. And in the beginning, Jesus felt confident to have a bunch of people. And then what's great is this is written by a guy who did just that. Mark jumped right in. Mark jumped head, head first into it. He didn't do too good. But you know what? So what? Mark's story actually adds to a little bit of the credibility of what Mark is telling us Jesus wants to provide. We don't have to have all the... Stop being so afraid. Of, what if I mess up? What if I don't do it right? You know what? That was the mindset of the Pharisees. They had instilled so much fear in people that they actually had this mindset. What was the worst thing? You, you saw a guy gets healed and the Pharisees show, that guy picked up his bed and is carrying it on a Sabbath. And, oh! and Jesus was like, stop it. Stop that. Stop giving everybody the idea that the worst thing that you can do in this life is fail. The gospel is designed to make you realize how much we fail on a daily basis. And we need God's help and His grace and His forgiveness. And He loves broken people who come to Him asking Him for that help. It is not the worst thing in life to say that I messed up. But there were religious people who gave people the idea and gave people, created the atmosphere that it was. And John came first of all saying, now I want to prepare you. You people aren't used to his, his preaching. This, this guy gives people chances you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> this guy tells people, uh, your sins are forgiven. When it seems like, really? Should we, should, should we go ahead and tell them that? <laughs> yeah. So I think this also is a great source of comfort that we all have a great opportunity to invite, to encourage, even as we're going through this gospel, bring as many people as we can. It doesn't matter how, how much experience we have. We may mess up a little bit. You know what? That's not the end of the world. We can learn as we go along. We can grow as we go along. And so, very quickly as we come to the end, we see immediately Jesus' ability to control the demonic activity. And that's what he came really to demonstrate that there was something more sinister than not doing everything exactly right, than not just having all the answers. And it was our attitude, how Satan has control over our hearts. Because Mark is later going to go on in the gospel and have a major confrontation about a bunch of Pharisees who thought it was the worst thing in the world to eat food without washing your hands. Because they actually got in their mind that if you don't go to this ritual purification, that somehow uh, you're going to eat something that could defile you, and then you're not fit in God's presence. You know what Jesus did? He said, that's a bunch of nonsense. Stop it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you eat. It doesn't matter <laughs> what's on that food. It's cleansed off food. You know what he said? It does matter. Your attitude. Satan has done a great job of deceiving us into allowing our hearts to be filled with the most filthy, vile kinds of things, including self-righteousness, pride, 
and self-sufficiency among all the other lists of sins. But Mark is basically showing that that's what Jesus came to do, is to demonstrate His power over the demonic influences that are warring against us. And Jesus was able to do that. They were marvelous. And He commands the unclean spirits and they obey Him. They flee. They, they, they come out. And one final point, it's kind of interesting, we're going to wrap this up, is uh, Mark is going to show at the end of his chapter two examples, of, uh, uh, close examples of people who were afflicted by the demonic powers and afflicted with diseases. One is a situation where in the, someone's house of Peter, it's his mother-in-law. And Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And he asks Jesus to come and help her. And Jesus comes and he takes her by the hand and raises her up and the fever leaves her and she goes on helping somebody. But then in the next scene we see something totally opposite. We see somebody who doesn't have a family. We see somebody who doesn't have people who care about him. We see an individual who's so isolated because of a situation he doesn't even have confidence whether or not Jesus would want to help him. He doesn't doubt whether or not Jesus can help him. He doubts, I know what this has done to me and I know how I'm looked at in the eyes of so many people and I know I'm the outcast of outcasts. And I'm amazed at the power that I see and if he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Mark shows that Jesus said, he said, I move with compassion. He said, I am willing to be cleansed. I in a major way what Mark was saying. I'm trying to show these two images. Is that the gospel is for all. We have situations where we look at our household and we see how the gospel could help the, the situations in my home. And yes, it can. The gospel can do great things for the, the things going on right in your, in your little neighborhood, in your, your area where you live. And the gospel is also for those who are living in the outskirts of society. That Jesus came not only for the situations, those maybe what we might look as uh, minor details that, that, that certainly Jesus is aware of, but whether it's your mother-in-law sick with a fever or the individual that nobody wants anything to do with and is isolated because of it, the gospel brings everybody together. And the gospel ought to unify us and make us all recognize that we all, no matter what the need is, we all need to repent and believe in the gospel. And so if there's anyone with us who recognizes that Jesus is the Christ, we hope that you will listen to what Jesus is preaching, what Jesus is teaching. It doesn't matter about religious formality. Yes, there are certain requirements that have to be obeyed so that we can appease God. But ultimately it begins with your heart and your attitude. If you recognize your need for God in your life and recognize that the choices that have brought sin in your life have taken you away from Him, realize that Jesus came upon the scene to say, I am the one who's perfect, who's never made a single mistake, but I came in this world not to just judge you for that, but to give you an inspirational hope that He wants to forgive and cleanse and give you the gospel. If anyone here is ready to receive it. We encourage you to confess Jesus, repent of your sins, be baptized, as Mark says at the end of the gospel, for the forgiveness of sins, or if you've already done that, you just need to come back and become more faithful. We encourage you, whatever the need be, come and just let us help you obey what we stand and sing.